So we're going to get started today with our uh, science lecture. Um, so I'm actually uh, thrilled to be the moderator for this conversation because we're actually going to have a double feature today. Uh, so for our first talk, let me introduce Dr. Holly Ga. Uh, some of you have maybe already seen her in some of the panels that she's been on. Uh, Dr. Holly Gaff is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at ODU and earned her PhD in mathematics. Uh, her research interests have focused mainly on studying the ecology of ticks and tick-borne diseases through an active surveillance project and mathematical modeling. And today she's going to be presenting some of that work and really focusing on how math intersects with the field of biology and what it means to be a mathematical biologist. Uh, so with that, uh, I, you know, I give the floor to Dr. Holly Gaff. Thanks, Alan. <clears throat> Happy to, to chat with you today and hopefully share a little bit about, about what I have, uh, my career path, and then and just making people aware that this whole field exists. So let me share my screen here. So <clears throat> um, we'll get a little bit into, into more into ticks in a bit, but I wanted to start with what is mathematical biology? And, I, and it's kind of one of those things where for people who like math, which hopefully there's a few of you out there that like math like I do, that um, it it's something that you want to use. And, and I was very interested in applying it. And so mathematical biology in short is really using math to study biological problems, which sounds pretty simple, but there's a lot of different ways you can take this. So kind of wanted to explain it from, from the, the scenic route of life that I've taken from, from undergraduate all the way through to where I am today. So I started out in undergraduate as a mathematics major, actually as a mathematical ed education major and was planning to go back and, and teach high school because a lot of the teachers at my high school who had been influential in my life were math teachers. And my father studied mathematics and my grandmother did a little bit of mathematics and my sister's PhDs in physics. And so there was a lot of math in my family. And quickly realized maybe in the end of my freshman year, beginning of my sophomore year, that education was just not my thing. Those classes were not enjoyable. I did the worst grades I got in college because they just didn't capture my interest. And so I decided I needed to find something different. So I looked around and I thought back to high school and I was like, well, my second favorite class was biology and my uncle was a medical doctor. And kind of like a lot of us, you, you, you kind of gravitate towards careers of your family or people you know. And so I didn't even know this kind of field that I've fallen into existed. So I went with the next thing. I said, well, maybe I'll be a medical doctor and I can be a math major and that'll make me more attractive to med schools because it's different. So I started taking biology classes thinking I was math pre-med and ended up in an ecology class. And my ecology professor is asked me point blank. He said, what are you doing in my class as a mathematician? And I told him I'm going to go to medical school. And he told me first day of class, first day I met the man. He's like, no, you're not. You're going to be a mathematical ecologist. And I was like, I'm going to be what? Um, never heard of it, didn't know it existed, and um, just to date myself a little bit, this was before the internet, so we didn't have the ability to go ask Dr. Google all these things. So I went and I, he started feeding me literature articles and started getting me interested in the idea of using mathematics to tackle biological problems. And so off I go to grad school, I get my PhD um, in mathematics at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. and. Um, to find that program, I actually sniffed around and found um, a mathematical ecology program. So um, it, it had an emphasis in, in ecology, but my, my PhD advisor still knew I had a little bit of that medical pre-health bent. And so when I got there, he happened to be on a project of a student who happened to be working on the outbreak of a tick-borne disease in Tennessee in the mid 90s and came back and said, well, here's a really interesting problem for you. Why don't you build mathematical models to understand tick-borne diseases? Because I now know he was a very, very, very good advisor and had gone off and looked around and found that very few people were working in this field. And so it kind of started me down this path that has led me to where I am, but it's not that simple. I took many more scenic steps in my life. And so after my PhD, I did some postdocs in mathematical epidemiology and then in back in math ecology and had a few other little random events going 
with things that didn't work out well for various reasons, long stories that are better um, told in, um, you know, other times, but ended up in the consulting world for a while and then came back to academics for another postdoc and then 9-11 happened and ended up in consulting, doing some disease modeling for them and ended up in the school of medicine and after all that kind of did a lot of the, well, that's not what I want to do kind of idea and came down here to ODU and finally had the opportunity 15 years ago when I came down here to really get back to this question of understanding ticks and tick-borne diseases. So kind of a scenic route, but you know, lots and lots of twists and turns. And so my goal with that is to say that I think, A, first of all, explore lots of things so you find what you want to do, but Hopefully you'll learn today that math biology is an option and it's a really cool option. So it's one of those questions I get asked a lot as to why do you need math? And so with mathematical biology, I think there's a whole bunch of reasons, but most of what you do is you build mathematical models. And so you could think of those as simulations or you can think of those as making uh, computer versions of the real world. And the reasons we do it are, all, are many, many different reasons. So some of them include um, it's a very useful way of describing the observed data. It's a very useful way of testing different assumptions, a lot of different things you can hypothesis testing. Um, we use it to understand future events or control programs, or to, you know, you can use it as a teaching method for ecological principles. Um, and so the very process of model building is actually useful because it asks lots of questions and you sit down and formally think through things. And I think the biggest thing that it allows us to do is to test a lot of scenarios that could either be unethical or it could be impossible, or it could be just too expensive. And so it builds a, a world where you can test out some of the ideas before you go out into the real world. <clears throat> and so another couple ways of thinking about why we do this is, so Sir Ronald Ross was a, was a biologic, mathematical biologist back at the turn of the last century. And a quote from him was that the mathematical method of treatment is nothing but the application of careful reasoning to the problem at issue. And so he worked in malaria and was understanding malarial um, as being a mosquito-borne disease, but really used mathematical methods to demonstrate that that was the, the vector rather than just being a, um, an airborne disease. Or Richard Hemming was like looking at the purpose of computing as insight, not numbers. Or the quote that I use that I talk every time I teach this class is that modeling is a quantitative tool that gives us a qualitative answer. And so these kinds of models are, are not necessarily the kind of um, thing that people would think, but they're very useful tools. Um, and just a couple other little comments that, that people often as biologists are uncomfortable with models or mathematics in general. And it, it, what we really want to use it for is understanding insights and providing this kind of experimental test bed for exploration. So thinking about how we can build out these different um, models and these different systems and these different understandings and the equations that underlie a lot of very complex biological um, systems is actually the thing that I think is a really cool application of mathematics. Um, I always remind people who are coming at this from the biology side that, that get bothered by the mathematics that doesn't seem to bother mathematical people, but we often end up with fractional animals or fractional people or things that seem impossible, or it allows us, to, it, it's much more of a place to dream and to think about things and, and really come up with these tools that help us understand our world around us. And so models don't always agree. Um, we use models in this, in, in the Hampton Roads area of Virginia here, we see them when we have hurricanes coming and we see that cone of uncertainty and every model has a little bit of different input and different output but we can use it to understand the systems around us. So that's kind of a little bit of the, of the big picture of math biology. At the end, I'm happy to answer more questions if people want examples, but there are people who are using mathematical biology to understand physiology. So they're looking at functions of, of certain cellular level of, of kidneys or of the pancreas or understanding diabetes or, or looking at climate change and all kinds of different things. And so, I wanted to give you a concrete example today of the work that I do. So as Alan said, when he introduced me, my world is ticks. My world is all about ticks and tick-borne diseases. And I always joke when I give these talks to some kind of audience that's maybe both people who are from the mathematics side and from the biology side, I, I can make both sets of people or pretty much everybody out there itch at some point. Because either you'll be 
bothered by all the ticks I'm talking about, or you'll be bothered by maybe the equations I'm talking about. And so hopefully at some point you'll be happy about some part and maybe a little uncomfortable, but try to try to understand how it all fits together. So talk a little bit about ticks, okay? Some fascinating fun facts you can now take with you from this talk and, and entertain people at parties, right? Um, there's a lot of different ticks in the world. There's about 865 species around the world. They are on all continents, including Antarctica. Um, they are, of course, vectors of human pathogens. They also cause problems for our pets and wildlife in general. Um, there are a number of different types of ticks. There's hard ticks and soft ticks. They have different life histories. And one thing that's important to recognize if you're, if you're speaking about these um, is that they are not insects. They're not quite spiders, but they are carids. They're closer related to spiders than they are to, to bugs per se. Um, so they are around, they all feed on different things. The thing that's gonna be interesting about them from a dynamics perspective and thinking about them is they have what I've termed a punctuated life history. So a, a lot of, uh, we when we grow, we just, we evolve very slowly over time. We don't have any kind of metamorphosis. So ticks are a little bit more like butterflies in that way that they, they change life um, stages. And so they are eggs when they start, they hatch out into larvae. If they're successful, they go out and get a blood meal from a host of some kind. They fall off, they molt, they completely rebuild themselves, they become a nymph, they come up, they feed. If they're successful, they'll fall off, they lay in the leaf litter, they molt, they come up as an adult, then they'll feed again, the females will lay eggs, and then they'll start the process again. So they get this one life cycle, and what's crazy about it is this entire life cycle can take years. And so rather than thinking about mosquitoes that are very short-lived or other insects that are short-lived, this process from egg to becoming a female and laying new eggs can be up to three to five years. For most hard ticks, it's one to two years. For some of the soft ticks, it can be up to 20 years. And so these insects, these, pardon me, these decarids live a very long time, which can make them very difficult to study. Um, some ticks are really, really picky in what they feed on, and they'll only feed on one species. There's ticks that we know only feed on rhinoceros. And so these ticks are actually, we think they're either endangered or certainly close to being extinct because they won't feed on anything else. And the rhinos population have gone down so much. Other ticks feed on all kinds of things and they're not as picky as the as this very host specific ticks. And so we don't quite understand all of why they choose what they choose. There's gotta be some compatibility with all of the different blood and proteins and such. Well, lots of things to study there. Um, they are incredibly hardy and widespread. Um, they are all, like I said, all around the world. Um, we do know that they cause a lot of diseases like Lyme disease. Most people have now heard of that. When I started studying this in the mid nineties, it was still coming into the scene and people hadn't really heard of it. And, and I wouldn't usually ask how many people have had Lyme disease, but now if it was a live audience, you can ask that question because most people either have had or know someone who's had a tick-borne illness, whether it was Lyme disease or Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which is now lumped together with a bunch of other spotted fever group or catsioses. If you're over in anywhere in Asia or Europe, tick-borne encephalitis is a big problem. In, in Africa and a lot of um, uh, Central and South America, there are a lot of animal diseases like East Coast fever or heart water or other um, uh, protozoan diseases. And so there's a lot of reasons to study and understand these ticks better, but there's very little work being done on them. So when I got to ODU, like I said, back 15 years ago, um, one of the most famous tick biologists in the world actually has is an emeritus faculty from the biology department. He started working for ODU when it was William and Mary and he studied ticks in our university for 54 years before we finally retired and has now moved to Northern Virginia. And so when I came to Old Dominion, I had been working on only the math side of all of these different tick questions for a long, long time. I was convinced that I could build mathematical models, I could understand these systems, and I refused to um, do a lot of the biology behind it. And, and one of the struggles that I'd been having was, as long as I'd been trying to build these models, I couldn't find data to support them. And if you've ever worked in modeling or any kind of mathematics, if you don't have the parameters for your system, you don't know what's going on. And the challenge with ticks, like a lot of things in public health, is that we only collect data when there are outbreaks. 
And if you only collect data when there are outbreaks going on, how do we know what it looks like when there are not outbreaks going on? And so it's kind of this challenge of really understanding um, long-term dynamics. And so I went to Doc Sunshine when I got to ODU and I said, all right, Dan, you have been studying ticks at that point for 50 some years. If anybody has these data set, you could have these data. Do you have these data? Do you know who have these data? And he looked at me and it's, he was a very, one of the kindest mentors I've ever had. And he said, no one's collected data thinking about modeling. Again, they collected thinking about epidemiology and about episodic outbreaks. He said, you can go outside, you can go outside for just a couple of years, maybe collect a few ticks, get the data set that you need, come back inside and build a models for the rest of your career. Well, that was in 2009 and here we are today and I'm still going out into the field. I was out in the field yesterday. Um, the, he had freely admits he tricked me because he knew I would get so interested in the data sets that I could create by this kind of long-term surveillance project that it would be very difficult to stop. So as I mentioned, ticks live for multiple years. And so if I want repeated data, which you often have to have, you need to go out for lots and lots of life stages of life histories of these ticks. So that means for multiple years, I have to go out multiple times. So we're in year, what, 11 now, 12, going to year 12 of these data points. We've collected ticks from the field every month or more often in the summer of the year, every at 12 sites in our area. Some sites we go out every other week in the summer. And we've done that consistently with the same transects, the same everything since 2009. And so we have this long-term history. And I would think by now I would be smarter, but I think I've actually learned, I know less than when I started because ticks are a very big challenge. And I'll show you some of these data and what we're trying to do with them. But the goal of it was we collect the ticks, we process them. I collaborate with Dr. Wayne Hines, and Dr. Dave Gauthier, who do a lot of the population dynamics and the uh, population assessment. So they've, they, they can do PCR to see what pathogens are carrying. We can do population genetics to look at relatedness of populations and looking at gene flow between different places. And then we wanna try and put all that back together into mathematical modeling to understand where there's risks and what we can do to control them. That's kind of our big picture, right? So just to give you some flavor, we are in the Virginia, state of Virginia. We are down in the Southeast corner. All the orange dots on this map are field sites that we have collected at. Like I said, every other week or so during the heart of the summer, which is when our ticks are up, and then once a week, once a month, at least in the winter, since 2009. And so across all these sites, we collect our ticks, we bring them back. How do we collect ticks, right? This is always a question I get asked. So there's standard vegetation, standard collection is a flagging of vegetation. So if you can see the big picture in the middle here, on the ground at our feet are our dowel rods and attached to that dowel rod is a piece of one meter square white denim cloth. Collecting ticks is the simplest science in the world. We literally walk down a path. We drag the cloth along the ground, wipe it across the vegetation. Ticks are attracted to carbon dioxide, heat and movement. And so at least most of my grad students and undergrads put out those things as well as me. So we go along, ticks think we are food. They grab a hold of the flag. We inspect the flag every five to 10 meters. Any ticks that are stuck on the flag, we pick them off, we put them in vials, and we take them back to the lab. So that's the bread and butter of our study. The, the downside to the, the upside of that is you get a lot of ticks. The downside is you don't get all ticks. So as I mentioned earlier, some ticks are very host specific. And so there are some ticks that are only interested in feeding on small mammals or rodents. And so those ticks are not going to be up in the leaf litter where I can get them with the denim cloth as I rub it across. And so for those, we actually have to do live mammal trapping. And so we, we do live trapping. It's kind of a day at the spa for the rodents. So they get all their ectoparasites groomed off. They get an earring out of it because we mark them and then we let them go. But they are never grateful for the day at the spa. We go to hunt check stations and pick ticks off deer. There are actually fewer hunt check stations than there used to be. That was a great way. And um, but we do, we stop at roadkill, which is always a very sexy thing to do. And the first time you stop, it's uh, disheartening to some of my undergrads to watch us all leap out of the car and run at something that's dead on the road. But ticks will actually stay on a dead animal for up to two to three days. And so we can often still collect the tick off of that animal. Um, we work with veterinarians, we work with various hum um, human groups. So the Army Corps of Engineers, Wetlands Mitigation Group gives us ticks. Some of the Mosquito Control Association groups give us ticks. Um, we did a couple of years of bird mist netting. 
Um, we, we leap on lizards, so the little tiny skink you can see in the picture here, actually there's a tick attached to it. If you have really good eyes, you can see that. So we've kind of tried to get a big picture of what's going on. So the majority, again, of the data that I have is from flagging, but we have all these other aspects of the data to try and help us understand how to interpret what we're seeing from what's attacking larger mammals. So just to give you some flavor of all ticks collected. So if you look at the, this is a graph on the Y axis is total ticks collected by flagging only. And on the X axis is year. So 2009 is not quite as high as all the other years. It was a lesson in learning how to write permits. And so it took me a little while to come up to speed on all of the things. And we also only started in June of that year, but 2010 forward, um, and I don't have the finalized 2019 data yet, but it'll be on here. Um, 2010 forward is, is probably um, approximately equal effort and totally different numbers of ticks. And so you can see that in most years we average between 15 and 25,000 ticks that we bring in, process, and identify and test for pathogens. Um, there are variations in years. So you can see that 2012 was the most ticks we've ever gotten. It was a it was a bumper crop year, and up until 2012, I, I was always saying that, well, 2012 was, was just warm, right? It was a really warm winter, and so I was like, well, my hypothesis would be that warm winters give us more ticks. And so as we went along through time, that seemed like a great hypothesis. And along comes 2018, which is our second highest year ever there. And 2018 was the year that we had 18 inches of snow and one of the coldest winters on record. So that kind of threw out that hypothesis. So like I said, every time I think I know something about these ticks, I don't. Um, one thing to notice on this graph is that the entire line is almost blue with little tiny slivers of other colors on the top. And so if you look at the legend, the blue color is Lone Star ticks. And so 95% plus of what we collect in our area are Lone Star ticks. They are ubiquitous. They feed on humans in all three life stages. They're very aggressive. Um, and certainly something I could talk about at another time is, is all the different aspects of the Lone Star Tick. We're gonna look a little bit more at the Black-Legged Tick, which is the one that can transmit Lyme disease today. But it is kind of interesting how, so if you'll notice in this graph, right, 2012 and 2018 were the highest years, but that's driven by those Lone Star Ticks. If I take Lone Stars out and I look at the tick species we wanna look at today, 20, on the right-hand side here are the graph for the black-legged ticks, and then now the bars are now the bars are colored by year rather than by species. I can see that 2014 was the highest black-legged tick year that I had, and it didn't follow the same 2012 being high and 2018 being high. So even whatever hypothesis I have about lone star ticks doesn't apply to black-legged ticks. The right, the left-hand side of this graph are dog ticks, and dog ticks did really well in 2012, just like Lone Stars, but they didn't come back down the following year. They were still high. So there's all these dynamics going on and each species of tick is gonna be different, mostly depending on what host they have and what the hosts are doing and how long the hosts live and where the hosts are going and how many you have of them each year. And so we can look at this data in a number of different ways. And so another way we can look at the black-legged nymphs. So again, I'm gonna focus on the black-legged ticks is time of year, right? So now this graph on the y-axis is ticks per meter squared, and on the x-axis is month of the year. So if I average all of my years, I can see that the nymphs come up in the summer, right? So these black-legged nymphs are coming up in the summer. If I had a graph for the larvae, they would also be up in the summer. So one year, the larvae would come up in the summer, and then if they feed, they successfully they come up the next year in the summer as nymphs, and if they succeed, they go another year, and then the fall and the adults actually come up in the winter, right? And so there'll be different dynamics going on. And then the question becomes, well, what do we have going on for hurricanes? And what do we have going on for other weather conditions? And what is going on with our host populations? And how are the dynamics changing? And, and I think I quickly realized that there's just so many angles to this data, right? And then layered on top of that is pathogen information. So we have really burgdorferi. That's the causative agent of Lyme disease. And depending on which population you sample and in what year, you have between 12 and 50% of the ticks are positive. Borrelia miyamotoi causes a relapsing fever. You get a 1% to 3%. They also have uh, Anaplasma phagocytophilum, which causes anaplasmosis, or babesios, babesiosis, which is caused babesiosis. So there's all these pathogens. So at this point, 
my brain hurts, right? I'm trying to understand year to year variation. I have within year variation, and then I have variation in the pathogens. And so I quickly run out of brain space to be able to understand all these dynamics or think about how they can layer on top of each other, how they can explain each other. And it just, yeah, it becomes a challenge biologically. I can collect all these data sets, but it really leads me up to the point where I want to build a math model that allows me to put in all these pieces that I do understand and see what the overall picture looks like. And so this is, um, We'll talk a little bit about tick control and then we'll come back to the model so that we have all the pieces when we get to the model. Okay, so one of the big questions if you have all these things going on is you want to get rid of them. People always, when I go to collect ticks, people always say, take them all, right? I'm like, I'm coming to collect ticks, I'm doing research. They always want me to take every tick there is out there because there is this fear of, of ticks and, and some of it is founded. They are, they do spread pathogens, they spread disease. Um, and so people want to get rid of them. How do you get rid of ticks, right? That's a great question. So again, biologically, there's a couple options. You can either do what's called environmental control or you can do host targeted controls. So an environmental control would be spraying chemicals in the environment, okay? You can go out and you can spray in a caricide, which will kill the ticks. Caricide is a fancy word for an insecticide. Um, in our area, a lot of those chemicals are not uh, licensed for use because if it runs off into the bay, it causes environmental problems downstream. Um, there's also some theories that it might not be the best for bees um, on honeybees and, and all the other bee species we're worried about. So we're, environmentally, that may not be the best option. It might be the only option around. Um, you can remove some leaf litter, which, which, which helps remove some of the hosts and desiccate some of the ticks. Or you can go with the other approach and host targeted. So, just like we have um, chemicals that you put on your dog or cat to keep them safe from fleas and ticks, there are similar things you can do. So a tick tube or a bait box would be putting that kind of chemical on a small mammal. So rodents can basically get treated because they play a role in, in this life cycle. You can put out what's called four posters where the deer or other wildlife will come and feed and they'll also self-apply that kind of frontline or, or advantage kind of chemical. And so they'll be treated. And so ticks that get on those animals will, will, will die. You can treat your livestock with porons or dipping and stuff like that. So you can, there's a couple different angles that you can, you can look at these different things. Um, and so again, environmental controls aren't necessarily the best thing because they harm other invertebrates, but host targeted controls are also bad because well, we can build some resistance. So the ticks like fleas could build up resistance to the chemicals and that's been shown overseas. Or you can alter the wild ecology for the wildlife. So if I am attracting rodents, I usually attract them by giving them food. And if I feed rodents, what do they do? They make more rodents. And so if they make more rodents, they're probably making more ticks in the long run. And so it's really unclear exactly how all of these controls actually work. So again, now there's another layer I can put into my model of understanding how these dynamics all play together. And so what a lot of people like to do is mix and match these things. So an ITM, we'll come back looking at ITM as an integrated tick management. So you put multiple things together to try and minimize the side effects and maximize the outcome. And so how I do that and which pieces do I pick and how do I put all the layers of these dynamics and what year is going on and how my hosts are changing. Well, this is a perfect opportunity to build a model because I can actually explore some of these questions in the air conditioning with the luxury of understanding and being able to repeat things when, when I want when I to change a little bit of what I understand. So this brings us to building a model, okay? So like I said, I got involved in tick-borne disease modeling in the 90s when I was in grad school. And at the same time, there was a group at the USDA that was creating some models. And one of the models they created was one called LimeSim. So if you can read the date at the bottom of this, this is 1994. If you're old enough to remember what a DOS system is, this was written in Microsoft Basic on a DOS box. And a couple of years ago, I was working with folks from the CDC on Lyme disease and on the data that I was collecting. And they were really interested in revitalizing this model and adding new data and understanding how it could be applied. And the, the downside was there are some papers written on this model and they, back in the day, I actually had contacted the guys, Gary Mount and, and Daniel Hale, who wrote this model, um, and they were retiring about that time, but they sent me a floppy disk. And if you, again, if you're old enough to remember a floppy disk, most of them um, don't live all that long, but somehow the one that I got from these guys made it with me 
through all of my travels, through all of that scenic route I told you about earlier. And so when the CDC contacted me, they were looking for a working version of this Lyme Sim model. Their version had corrupted. The USDA didn't have it anymore. It seemed like nobody in the world had a working version. Well, first of all, you had to have DOS. So it was an ancient thing, but amazingly, my version started working and so was still working. So I was able to bring up the old simulation as well as being able to understand the mathematics of the side. And so they they wanted me to redo this model. And um, I took the papers and I took the software and recreated it into a current model and learned a lot along the way about what they said they did in their model that they didn't actually do. But that's another story. So originally this was, they had started from mosquitoes. So these guys are mosquito modelers. They took mosquito life history. They turned it into a cattle fever tick model. They took the cattle fever tick model, turned it into a dog tick model, went from there to a lone star tick model, and then finally came to the black legged tick or the Lyme sim model. So it was this, there were a lot of relics in the model that were left from, from the older models that weren't necessarily around. Um, and so we took the best parts of Lyme sim, we updated with new findings, and we're looking at testing these on various control options. And so we're calling it Lyme sim 2.0. It's uh, now published, it's out in the journal medical entomology. And, um, and it's hopefully a useful tool for people to be able to think about things, but we certainly learned a lot along the way in recreating this particular model. And so basically the model way it works is I have a black-legged tick, so Exodes scapularis. So those are the ticks that can transmit the pathogen that causes Lyme disease. And then I have six host types. And so the entire world, this is where I switch my hat, right? I always talk about it. I've been a biologist up until now. I've been interested in all the details of exactly when and where and what and all of that and know that there are nuances to all of these things. And then I switch roles and to become a mathematician where I put everything into a box. And I say that, okay, all white-footed mice are the same, all black-legged ticks are the same. I'm gonna take all small mammals and birds and call them the same host type. I have a reptile host type. I have a medium-sized mammal host type, white-tailed deer, and the things called insectivores, which are mostly uh, short-tailed shrews and, and um, some leased shrews. The original model had a livestock host type, which was a relic for when they did the cattle fever ticks, um, and it was not very useful for Lyme disease and played no role in it. So we took that one out. But these other six play some roles. White-footed mice are usually the ones tied very closely to um, amplifying the bacteria in the wildlife. But the insectivores, the shrews, play an equal role, and they're very different animals in what they what they are attracted to in their life histories. Um, small mammals and birds are assumed to not be very good at Lyme disease amplification. Reptiles are actually refractory, and so they they can feed ticks feed on them, as I showed you that picture of the tick on the skink. But they they actually will clear the tick of the pathogen often. Uh, Medium sized mammals we don't quite know, and then uh, white tailed deer are not going to amplify Lyme disease, but they're really, really good tick food. And so they make lots and lots of ticks when they feed on white-tailed deer. So it's this kind of interesting um, different host types. And so now we have to understand all of these different pieces of it. And what we put it together is we're using what's called a matrix life history model with a weekly time step. And so um, each of these different time steps, we have all the different ticks. This is just the ticks. Okay, and so I keep track, like I had said earlier, it had a punctuated life, so it goes from eggs to larvae to nymphs to adults. And so for each within each of those stages, we also have a number of different activities. And so um, one concept that I will be talking about, and I don't think is all that familiar to a lot of people, is what's called cumulative degree weeks. It's just an entomology and crop science, but I count a degree above a certain threshold, and then I sum that until it meets a different threshold. Okay, so by each tick, I know how long it's been around, and for every degree above, say, 60 degrees, it gets counted, and then once it meets a bucket, it basically puts them into its bucket. Once it gets that bucket full, it moves to the next trick. And so this is known in, in entomology and crop science to be a very useful tool. And so if I look at different um, accumulations of these things, you could have different thresholds. They get cut off in different places. But ticks will often go into hibernation over the winter, depending on the tick and depending on the species and what they're doing, um, and then come back up in the spring. And so it can delay some of the timing of their emergence, but not as much as you would think because you don't accumulate anything in the winter. So it doesn't really matter. They just go into that stasis. So if I look at eggs, right? So when eggs are laid, they're in the environment. 
and they wait until they have a certain number of days that have accumulated with a certain temperature. And once that threshold is met, then they become larvae. The larvae then spend a week hardening, and then they go out looking for hosts. And so the time that they spend looking for hosts is pretty much open-ended. Um, it's up to 80 weeks, which is a long time, right? 52 weeks in a year, so it's almost two years that they can look. But they actually lose weeks of life for every week they are truly questing. So just because they're ready to go looking for food doesn't mean they're actually up. The weather has to be right. There have to be hosts around. There's a number of cues that they're looking for. And what there happens that we put into this model is they're penalized in fat reserves, right? If they're out looking for questing, if they're up, they're not hibernating, they're expending more energy. And so that fat reserve determines the maximum length of time they can survive. So once they've found a host, they'll be on host, all right? And then they have a week that they spend feeding on the host. Then they fall off and then they're in gorged phase. Again, this is kind of a temperature related, how quickly they molt. And there's some limitations on the threshold. So it has to be a certain length of time and certain temperatures. And then they molt and when they molt, they become nymphs. They repeat the whole process again. So they harden, they host seek, they find a host, they feed, they engorge, they drop off right and until they molt again into adults and so the adults then follow the same process so the same steps through except after the engorgement process the females are assumed to lay eggs which start this whole thing again so that's kind of a nice model that we now understand from what we have from all of our data and so it repeats this process and repeats this process all right so host seeking again is a little bit of a misnomer because it should be available for host seeking and only the portion that actually is questing depends on the day length. Ticks can actually measure day length. They have a uh, very rudimentary eyes on some species that allow them to, to do light dark sensing. Um, and so they can measure whether day length is increasing or decreasing. They base it on humidity and temperature and, and wind speed and a whole bunch of other things. Um, so we could put all of those things into the equations for understanding when they're host seeking and not. Um, and then there's the lifespan I explained. So, right, host populations, we're just keeping them constant in this model right now. We'll eventually look to add dynamics for the, for the hosts. But there is a maximum number of ticks for each life stage by host type. So larvae and nymphs can feed on everything. Adults only feed on the larger two hosts. Um, and the maximum number of ticks per animal is determined by the just the, the surface area of a mouse. You can't fit more than a certain number of ticks on a mouse or even on a white-tailed deer. Um, so the pathogen dynamics, we're looking at vector-borne transmission only. Um, and so ticks, if they feed on an animal that's infected, will get infected. And if the animal is fed on by infected ticks, there's a probability of infection. And so it goes back and forth. And so as I mentioned, white-footed mice and the insectivores are the major reservoir for this pathogen. Small mammals and birds and medium-sized mammals play a small role. Reptiles and white-tailed deer do not. Right, so how we measure the outcome standards are um, the density of infected nymphs and the density of all nymphs. And so we really want to know what's going on. And I only measure surplus questing nymphs because I assume the hosts get there first. And so I want to show you some of the results that we got out of these models. Once we throw all that stuff together, we picked three locations. So um, I task in Minnesota, here in Norfolk, Virginia with my data, and then upstate New York, um, outside of Cary Institute for Ecosystem Studies. And so if I run the model and I use actual weather data information, I can get some variations and estimations for how many ticks I get. And so what's very interesting to me was I was not collecting in 2007, but it looks like it would have been the bumper crop year. And if you remember from back when I was talking in the beginning, if you're still awake, um, the bumper crop year that I had for black-legged ticks in Virginia was 2014. And so this model agrees that that should have been the highest year of all the years I've been sampling. If I go to New York, it gives a different years for being high versus low, right? So this black line is the density of infected nymphs. The red line underneath it is the density of, I mean, pardon me, black line is all nymphs. Red line is infected nymphs per meter, 100 meters squared across the years. The peaks that you're seeing are each summer. And so the summers in New York are varying between zero and I mean, between zero up to 30 six nymphs per meter, 100 meters squared. If I go to Minnesota, we get a lot more variation in Minnesota. And this is also bears out in a lot of the field data that we've collected. And so these data are not 
far off from the dynamics of what's going on. And we were trying to validate them. And so some years in Minnesota, you'll get lots of ticks. And some years in Minnesota, like 2008, there were almost no ticks. And that also is very true in the data that have been collected up there. So it's much more variable in Minnesota. We started comparing to various things. And so this graph is really messy. But what I want you to look at is the green line are field data and the black line are model results. And so for Minnesota and Virginia, we're not too terribly far off. Again, remember 2010, 29, I was still learning a lot of things. Um, but there's it follows some of the similar dynamics of what's going on for the green and the black lines. The red line is the density of infected NIMS, which is just a constant across the top for both of these groups. If I instead look at Minnesota, I mean, pardon me, New York, what we learned is that if I use a constant white-footed mouse population, which I told you we used constant for everything, the green line and the black line don't match at all. And so that made me pause. And one of the big things that the folks in New York who are working on these data have said is they have these really wide swings in white-footed mice populations that are a result of the acorn um, masting. So masting is a term that acorn oak trees in, in New York tend to drop their acorns in the same year. And so there's like all the acorns or no acorns. And when there's all the acorns, the mice eat them and be all the mice. And if there's all the mice, then they tend to get all the ticks. And so what we went to was we actually got some estimates of, of rodent populations across the years from some of the site in the New York area and put that in instead of this constant. And we got a better fit. It's still not the best fit. So there's still some other things we need to figure out about New York that tells me that some places are probably host dependent like New York. Whereas these guys, these sites here in Minnesota and Virginia look like the weather determines quite a bit of what we're seeing. And so even from this simple model, from this very simple application, we could start understanding what's driving these systems. And it's different in different locations. So another question, if you remember, we were asking was what we can do about this, right? So we wanted to do some interventions. So the interventions that we pulled into our model were that four poster, that deer treatment. So that's gonna give me additional mortality for ticks feeding on deer only. I can put in white-footed mouse, which is additional mortality for ticks feeding on mice only. Or I can do some kind of broadcast acaricide where I just spray, I assume it lasts for four weeks, and any tick actively looking for a quest, actively questing for a host is killed, okay? So I can do each of these independently, I can do them for the three results. I can, I don't have all these, I'm not gonna show you all of these, don't panic there, but I ran these for three locations for three different treatment amounts for five, five different, how long do I wanna run it? One year, two years, three years, five years, 10 years. I can do them in single, or I can put them in that integrated tick management for some kind of combined treatments. And so if I ask the questions, well, what if I just do deer treatment alone? So all I'm treating, white-tailed deer have additional treatment. And so, the way you read this, this is actually, well, it says week. These are actually years of data by week, okay? The Cs are for the years that we're treating. So this is a five-year treatment. So if I treat white-tailed deer for five years, what I can see is I get a pretty significant drop, in the, but it takes four years to get there. And if I stop after the fifth year, within four years, I'm right back where I started, okay? So treatment does work. It's expensive. It takes a long time to get to that level. If I look at just treating white-footed mice, I get a pretty significant increase to start with, and then it stays there. I don't get any additional benefits, okay? But what's a little bit scary is when I stop, two years later, I actually get higher than I would have had if I had done nothing. So there's a rebound effect when I'm treating white-footed mice. If I broadcast a caricide, I spray, Right? You would think that would knock, ticks are basically gone. Remember, these are only the surplus ticks. And so while I spray and get rid of a whole bunch of ticks, as soon as I stop spraying, within three years, the ticks are right back where they were, and they are back with a vengeance. We actually have a huge number of ticks in the years after we stopped spraying. All right, so well, broadcast, and again, remember broadcast care side we can't use in a lot of places because of the environmental consequences. Well, what if I combine things? What if I do deer and white-footed mice? Well, I still get some benefit much quicker like I do with the white-footed mouse, but I still have that rebound effect a couple of years after I stop. So, so implementing a, a treatment that I'm not gonna maintain may actually have some knock-on effects for endangering the situation after stopping. 
If I do deer plus a care side, I get a little bit longer of a time, but I still have a rebound effect, right? I can ask white-footed mice for it. So you can play this game with all the options. You can throw the whole kitchen sink at it. What if I do all the things? I say I have all the money in the world. I'm going to do all of the things. I still only get five years of, of, of peace and quiet, right? And then I get another four years. They start coming back, another maybe year, and then a year of rebound. And so three or four years later, I'm right back where I was to start with. So ticks are not going to go away in any easy way. Um, nor do we necessarily want them to, by the way, because ecology is not something to be messed with, and they do have an ecological role. We may not understand it completely, but um, they they do serve some purposes out in the um, out in the ecology, or they wouldn't be there. So, concluding, right? Um, we certainly can reduce tick populations. They require significant input. They require multi years. You stop, they're right back. Broadcast to care sites are the most effective alone, but they also have the most environmental consequences. And you can get some combinations that help. And what I have an undergraduate right now looking at is what if I do every other year or every two years or every three years? And so we're looking to try and figure out what kind of patterns and implementations of these ITMs, not just all the time at full amount, could we possibly do to actually reduce some risk of human um, tick encounters? So, of course, there's limitations as there are with every model. This is a closed system. I'm as, there's no space in this system right now. I'm also working on trying to include that. And the inventor interventions were immediately effective and constant, which is, of course, not true as well. Um, and so we need to look at a little of the nuances of how some of these treatment works and don't work. And so we definitely are, like I said, I have, a, I have working with a group from Holland University that are looking at timing of acaricides and hopefully actually working with my nephew of all people, looking at some spatial dynamics um, for this particular model. Um, and with that, I would like to acknowledge that this is certainly not work I've done alone. I have had a passel of grad students, current and former grad students who are out working hard um, in the field with me. Um, I have a faculty that I've mentioned that I'm working with. There have been more than 50 undergraduate lab and field assistants over the years that have done a lot of stuff. And, and our funding is from the CDC and NIH. Um, Henry Jackson Foundation and a few others as well. So um, with that, I will take questions. I, I, I got so into the talk that I forgot that I'm also the moderator here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like waiting for questions to show up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thank you for that. That was uh, clearly uh, a great talk so much that you, you captured my attention entirely. Um, so we, we have a, a good a few questions here from the audience. Um, the first question is, is a, um, a more directed just you as an individual doing this kind of research uh, comes from Erin from uh, Antarctica. Um, anyway, um, they're wondering if you've been bitten by a tick yourself. Sure, great question. So, I mean, we joke that the first rule in my lab is that you may not be your own data point. But um, that said, most of us at some point have been have at least had a tick trying to bite us. So I've probably in the 15 years I've been out doing this work have maybe had five or six that have been successful. Um, we do have a lot of mutual grooming. Um, so the, our grad my students and I, we work very well. If you saw in the picture, our boots are to our knees. During heavy tick season, we duct tape our pants to our boots. And so the tick actually has to crawl all the way up us, um, tuck your shirt in. And so by that point, usually somebody in the group has seen it. Um, I have, um, yeah, so it's, a, but it, it does happen. I have not been my own data point at this point, which is good. Um, so hopefully we'll keep it that way. Good. Uh, we have another question um, from Taiwan. Uh, this question is, is programming essential for this field? And what language if programming is essential? Furthermore, how can a high schooler get more involved in this field? And is this a major in colleges? Sure, great question. So um, I do think computer programming gets you a long ways. As far as um, what language, I don't, my training, I don't think it matters because once you've learned a programming language, it's fairly, easy to pick up other programming languages. Um, I, I started out in, in languages that don't even exist anymore. So like Pascal and, and like I said, basic and a lot of languages that are not used, but the concepts are pretty cross 
platform. Um, and so any programming that you can get will never hurt. And what predicting, especially at your high school, predicting what language we're going to be programming in 10 years from now when you're going to the job market is probably impo impossible to guess. So learn all the programming as many languages is really helpful, I think. Um, from a high school perspective, I mentioned that I'm working on this special problem with my nephew. He is a high schooler. He did this for his AP research project. So I think that there are opportunities to reach out to math biologists across the world and ask for a small piece of their model that they can give you um, to play with. I think that there's a lot for AP research or research in general that's uh, it, it's pretty open. And the last piece there are, the Society for Mathematical Biology has a list of colleges and universities that have majors or minors in math biology. So it's smb.org um, has, a, has a list for their education site that lists those programs. And, you know, just a follow up in this question, if they're, at, you know, geographically constrained for whatever reason, would you recommend that a student do the math or the biology if they had to pick one or like, how would you navigate that or what yes. would be your recommendation? Absolutely. So the, the professor I mentioned that my ecology professor from undergraduate actually influenced me heavily on that and I have to agree. So he brought me an article. The article had one one sentence highlighted and the highlighted sentence said more math means more money. Right. And I don't know that that's true that I'm rich, but um, but his point was that if you are trained as a mathematician, you would be you are much more flexible in where you can go. So I'm tenured. I'm a full professor at a biology department with a PhD in mathematics. I don't know of anybody who has a PhD in biology that's been able to go to a mathematics department and get a, and get tenured. And so it's easier to cross the, the bridge to, to the biology side than it is to the mathematics. And so the more math you do and the more math degrees you pick up. And, and like I said, my undergrad was almost a double major in math and environmental science. My PhD has an emphasis in mathematical ecology. So you can pick those classes up as you go along, but the, it's really difficult to go back and relearn the math because it's so cumulative. Um, but biology is changing so quickly that biologists have to constantly relearn everything and retool themselves. And so with bioinformatics coming on the scene, you, you can start out with when they start out because it's just so much and so new um, that allows a lot to, to learn. Great advice. Um, the next question uh, is from Rami from Ecuador. Um, they wrote, uh, I've heard of logistics maps uh, and that those had something to do with animal population growth. Have you ever gotten into one of those logistics maps? Has this anything to do with them? So I'm assuming he's talking about logistic growth and logistic modeling. It's probably some of the original models that a lot of people have, have looked at. Um, and so in the model we have right now, we're doing constant populations, but that is certainly looking at um, including some logistic growth and logistic equations in the host populations and the way that we capped the number maximum number of ticks per host does feed back into a logistic as well and so the ticks will grow up to the number of hosts that are around and they don't grow any further than that and so there's that restriction that was actually missing from the original model um, my answer um, and the last question, just for our purposes of time, because we do want to transition to our, our next uh, host, um, Jamie from Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico writes, what math concepts have you seen that have been the most abundant in the model that you've worked with? Uh, also, they know how very interesting of a presentation this was. Sure. So I think I've, I've, I've used a variety of mathematical modeling techniques. And so this is, again, one that speaks highly to my, my PhD advisor at University of Tennessee, Lou Gross, was, was very much uh, my PhD dissertation, for example. I had matrix models like this, and I had differential equation models. And so to me, it's, I'm far more about the conceptualization of what tools do you need? And so is it spatial, or is it, is it, does it push you to the right type of model that you need. Um, and so conceptually, space and time constraints and questions and hypotheses will push you, um, certainly need to know how to do differential equations, you certainly need to know how to do a matrix model, you certainly, but even my Asian-based models is basically just, you know, overgrown Pac-Man. I mean, it's a simple simulation, probabilistic simulation can get you a long ways down the road. So um, I think 
just keeping a basket and an open mind that rather than looking at the world with your hammer and thinking everything is a nail is a is it makes you a better modeler well thank you dr gaff uh for joining us and giving this amazing presentation um we may get a few additional questions that pop in uh even while dr porter is talking next um what i'll do is i'll forward those questions and then maybe you can give a short response that will include it with the recording of this session great absolutely Okay, um, and you know, I, I've been asking of this of all my presenters, but you know, just to make it clear to uh, the uh, audience, um, I, I would imagine that you'd be totally open and welcome to having uh, participants reach out to you if they have any further questions themselves. Absolutely, absolutely. Anytime talk about math and ticks and people don't run away is great. <laughs> great. Well, thank you very much for your time. Have a great afternoon. Thank you too.